Good evening and welcome to Guelph Museum's military lecture series. My name is Ken Urban. I'm the education coordinator at Guelph Museums and I would like to thank the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada for their partnership in this series. And yes, you may have noticed that their name has changed. It's no longer the Laurier Center for Military and Strategic Disarmament Studies. It's now the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada. Uh, and we want to thank them for all their great assistance with this series. Uh, tonight, uh, we are very pleased to have Dr. Matthew Wiseman share his research on Canada's atomic soldiers. Uh, the talk's going to be about 45 minutes in length, uh, and at the end we'll have time for Matthew to answer some questions. And if you want to ask a question, simply go to the question and answer menu. And this menu can be found at the top right of your screen by clicking the speech bubble icon. And to ask questions in the question and answer feature, select ask a question. Type in your name or select post as anonymous. Uh, type in your question and send uh, select send. Uh, and then we'll see your question and answer it during the question and answer period at the end of the talk. If you do have any problems with viewing Matthew's presentation, it can be viewed later uh, as it is being recorded and will be made available on Guelph Museum's social media platforms. Before we begin, uh, we would like to acknowledge that Guelph is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabek people specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. We must do more to learn, share and support truth and healing. Guelph Museums continues to build our knowledge and relationships about the land, its history and its peoples. This commitment informs all that we do at Guelph Museums. Now, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Matthew Wiseman. Uh, he is a Banting Fellow in the Department of History at St. Jerome's University uh, in the University of Waterloo. His research focuses on the history of science and technology in modern Canada, with an eye to understanding the social impacts of scientific research and technological development. His published work examines the political and ethical dimensions of state-sponsored research conducted at government, private, and academic institutions. He also studies the history of Canada's National Research Council and the role of gender in the development of, and progression of the natu natural series, sciences. Uh, Dr. Wiseman holds a PhD in history from Wilfrid Laurier University and the Tri-University Tri Graduate Program in History. Upon the completion of his doctoral degree, he held a two-year fellowship in the Department of History at the University of Toronto and later a one-year Associated Medical Services postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of History at Western University. So we've done a lot, Matthew, and we really want to thank you for joining us tonight, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. Uh, it's something I don't know very much about, and I'm sure a lot of our, our attendees uh, are really interested in hearing about it, because it's something that's really, we, there hasn't been much written about it, I don't think. So I'd like to turn it over to you, and thanks again for joining us. Hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I just want to uh, say good evening and thank you everyone for joining me here. Uh, before I begin, I also want to provide a public acknowledgement of the traditional territory upon which I currently live and work. I reside in the city of Waterloo on the traditional territory of the Neutral, Anishinaabek, and Haudenosaunee's peoples. The University of Waterloo, where I work, is situated on a Haldeman tract, the land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River. Also want to extend my thanks, of course, to Ken and Serena and, uh, and the, the Guelph Museums for the kind invitation to speak with you today. And also to Eric's story and the kind folks at the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada. This is certainly an important partnership between the Guelph Museums and the Laurier Center. And as a former Laurier student myself, it certainly gives me pleasure to return to the stage and speak with you this evening. I regret not being with you in person today, but uh, I wish the circumstances were different. But nonetheless, uh, wherever you are joining us from virtually, I hope you are all well and thank you for your time this evening. The topic that I want to address with you uh, this evening is, is about the history of Canadian soldiers who were exposed to live radiation during nuclear testing during the early decades of the Cold War, primarily during the 1950s and the 1960s. But before I delve into that topic, allow me to give you a brief biographical information about myself and how I came to research this particular area of Canadian military history. I'm a Canadian historian and a historian of the Cold War period primarily, and much of my work focuses on the history of science as applied in the military context. And what that means more precisely is that the bulk of my professional work focuses 
on an, examining the history of human experimentation, government or military funded science in Canada, as I said, during the early Cold War period and the decades immediately following the Second World War. Now, the Second World War, as we all know, was a global conflict. War was fought on land, at sea and in the air. And in these three different in operational environments, if you will, well, they pose numerous challenges for soldiers, sailors, and indeed for aviators. Well, science itself played a crucial role in helping to secure Allied victory during the war. And the development and use of radar and sonar, for instance, or the development and widespread application of penicillin. And indeed, perhaps the epitome of science during the war, the development and the use of the atomic bomb. But importantly for my talk here today, military officials in Canada, United States, and the United Kingdom came away from the war convinced that science, technology, and engineering were fundamental to military efforts moving forward. Soldiers, sailors, and aviators had to prepare to fight war anywhere in the world, be it in the Canadian Arctic, or in a, perhaps a tropical environment, or a desert region or environment as well. Now, I just recently finished a forthcoming book that explores the history of this uh, particular context that is military science in Canada, which focuses on the Canadian Arctic in the early Cold War period. That's certainly part of a much larger history that I don't have time to delve into with you today. But in terms of science at the end of the war, at the end of 1945 in particular, it's important to understand that science had became absolutely crucial, excuse me, to military applications. And as we all know, the onset of the Cold War in 1946, 1947, and the reality of a potential nuclear war between East and West began to set in quite rapidly. And that's a crucial point worth repeating. Of course, it's important that we keep in mind chronology. The first full-scale thermonuclear device was detonated in November of 1952. But prior to that date, before 1953, the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki represented the most advanced and dangerous military threat known to exist. This point is extremely important, especially in the context of military training during the early Cold War. The atomic weapons tested at the Nevada, at the Nevada test site in the United States or at the Marlin Range in southern Australia and in other locations varied in size and force. But in general, leading military and defense officials in the West believed that science and the notion of science was the notion and the belief that atomic war did not necessarily mean total annihilation. There was a belief that a small scale nuclear war was possible. And indeed, prior to the 1950s, scientists and military officials in response believed and argued that a small scale war conducted with nuclear weapons was possible. It was conceivable. And furthermore, there was the belief that civilians on the ground could survive a first strike nuclear attack. And this one possibility, this one conceivable scenario, as ludicrous as it might sound in hindsight today, is what drove many scientists and military officials to argue in favor of military preparations for small scale nuclear war. And what did that mean? Well, in reality, it meant having to train soldiers, sailors, and aviators, military personnel for the nuclear battlefield of tomorrow. And this was a top military necessity. But this also meant then, in, in the process of training soldiers, sailors, and aviators for nuclear war, it meant that this meant exposing real people, of course, to radiation. Military personnel were exposed to atomic weapons tests that were designed to test not just weapons themselves, but also to test human capabilities under the conditions produced by an actual nuclear detonation or a series of nuclear detonations. And the military personnel who participated were quite often told that these tests were routine and safe, when in reality, they were anything but routine and they were certainly not safe. Now, I am not a medical doctor, I am not a nuclear physicist, nor am I a person who was directly affected by the nuclear testing that occurred at Nevada, at Marlinda, or at other sites during this period of the Cold War. I do come from a military family, but I do not have relatives connected to this history per se. 
I come at this topic strictly from the perspective of a Canadian historian. And I want to use my time with you here this evening to share with you some of the knowledge that I have gained about this topic. And perhaps more importantly, I want to share with you my knowledge of the nuclear testing that occurred, the military preparations that were involved, and the documents that have survived detailing this history and the story of the military personnel that were involved. Now, as a historian, I make no attempt to draw a direct connection to, from radiation exposure and sickness or death or indeed heartache suffered by many veterans and their families of the individuals that were involved. This is not my story to tell. Instead, I want to offer here a small glimpse into the Canadian experience with nuclear war and the military preparations that occurred on the ground. So the question, of course, is where to begin? Well, during the early Cold War, the United States, the United Kingdom, conducted a range of nuclear tests that were designed to study the effects of radioactive fallout. Scholars working in both countries, the United States and the United Kingdom, have since documented this topic extensively, covering both the military and political dimensions of nuclear weapons testing in the West. The same, however, cannot be said of Canada. Although an equal partner in the North Atlantic Alliance, Historians, I argue, know relatively little about Canada's role in American and British nuclear weapons testing after the end of the Second World War. And this is where my work comes into play. My research in this area examines Canadian participation in nuclear fallout research during the early Cold War, specifically by tracing the history of number one radiation detection unit. This was a tri-service unit of the Canadian military established in 1950 to assess radiological hazards for the Canadian military. Now, RDU, Radiation Detection Unit, as I mentioned, was a tri-service unit, which meant that it included members of the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. While Canadian personnel uh, participated in nuclear weapons tests prior to the mid-1940s, no government or military representative from Canada participated actively in fallout research prior to the formation of number one RDU in the 1950s. Now this unit functioned as a mobile radiological field lab, which I will explain here today. But the unit assessed nuclear toxicity at blast sites in both the United States and Australia, namely at the Nevada test site in the United States and Maralinga, a British test site located in the desert of southern Australia. The unit also coordinated and carried out the testing and evaluation of equipment under nuclear test conditions and functioned as a training school for the education of civil defense workers in Canada during this period in history. Now my research into the history of RDU has two fundamental goals. First I want to bring number one radiation detection unit into the light and give the unit the, the historical research attention it deserves. Secondly, I want to answer a primary research question that underlies my work in this period of Canadian history. And that question is quite simply, were Canadian personnel exposed to unsafe levels of radiation for the purpose of scientific experimentation? Now, before I answer that question, allow me to be perfectly clear. It is my understanding, based on the information available to me at this time, the personnel of number one RDU were not human test subjects. They were not guinea pigs used in military experimentation to examine the effects of nuclear radiation on the human body. That being said, though, they certainly were human guinea pigs in the broader Allied project to design, develop, and improve atomic weapons. RDU was composed of military personnel who had little to no experience with the science or with radiation in particular. They used guider Mueller counters and other devices to measure radioactivity near ground zero shortly after controlled detonation. And as you can quite imagine, entering a radioactive test site shortly after a nuclear explosion was extremely dangerous to say the least. But again, I return to this basic research question that underlies my research and my discussion here with you this evening. Were personnel of, no, of number one RDU exposed to unsafe levels of radiation for the purpose of scientific experimentation? Well, this is an extremely loaded question that I do not take lightly. 
But first, allow me to provide a bit of historical context into the period. So on March 8th, 1950, Lieutenant General Charles Fulks, Chief of the General Staff, penned a letter to Canada's Minister of National Defense, Brooke Claxton. Now in his letter, Fulks requested permission to form a special unit of the Canadian Army designated number one radiation detection unit. Quote, this is what Claxton wrote. Owing to the likely use of atomic bombs in any future war, it is considered that immediate steps should be taken to perfect measures for handling an atomic bomb disaster in any city or area. There is a need for specially trained personnel who can assist in solving the radioactive problems associated with any potential attack." Close quote. The folks also stressed the importance of training army personnel in passive defense against atomic bombs. An experimental unit such as RDU, he argued, would serve as a medium to test Canada's defense organization, procedures, personnel, and equipment as a whole. Right? So this again was a military application that was meant to work in conjunction with civil defense during this period of the early Cold War. He essentially said that a special unit uh, to measure radioactivity and this unit could also be trained in how to solve any potential civil defense issues of a nuclear attack. Now, the Canadian officials did not necessarily know how such a unit would be trained, but the theory and applicability of such a unit was conceived. Now, you might see that I'm reading a little bit too much into one letter or one document, but if Canadian personnel were exposed to unsafe levels of radiation, then I think it's important that we need to know why of course, for determining causation. And I argue in my work that military officials and defense scientists in Canada who conceptualize and form number one radiation detection unit, I argue that they lacked significant knowledge about the dangers of radiation. Now, images such as these two images on your slide emphasize my point. In complete fairness, of course, these images are not Canadian. These images uh, are instead of an American journalist, the one on the right, Gene Sherman, hunkering down behind three soldiers in a small bunker. But these images are exactly what Canadian personnel who formed number one RDU would have experienced. These were soldiers who were sent, as I mentioned, to Nevada in the United States and to the Marylander Range in Southern Australia desert. And they experienced live nuclear detonations from a relatively close distance. They witnessed nuclear explosions from distances, in fact, that were thought to be safe and that were measured accordingly. And as I'll explain more about the nuclear testing in a moment, but before I think these images provide some important contextual footing, one of the reasons that I do not have directly images of the Canadian experience is because this research at the time would be considered classified. And it's difficult to obtain images or records of the Canadian experience nonetheless. Now in April of 1953, personnel of number one radiation detection unit were employed on a decontamination task at Chalk River. Now Chalk River was a nuclear reactor and scientific research facility located on the Ottawa River, approximately 180 kilometers from Canada's capital. According to recently released documents, the test involved a possible exposure to an ionizing radiation over a period of one month time, an amount of radiation that at the time was considered abnormally high by medical staff in the Canadian government. In fact, Brigadier K.A. Hunter, who was Director General of Medical Services in the Canadian military and the Department of National Defense, expressed his concern for the individual levels of radiation exposure experienced by number one radiation detection unit personnel at Shock River during testing. At the time, the International X-ray and Radium Protection Committee, now known as the International Commission on Radiological Protection, set the international safety standards for bodily exposure to radiation. The recommended ex exposure level 1953 was a limit of 0 0.3 Ronkin per week for whole body exposure. But according to Brigadier Hunter's assessment, personnel of number one RDU were exposed not to 0 
but rather to five Ronkin of ionizing radiation per month. At this level, personnel of number one RDU experience radiation exposures approximately 76% higher than the recommended international safety standard. And this is certainly an important consideration for assessing the medical and the ethical implications of radiation detection tested in Canada during the early Cold War period. But after training in Canada, albeit not with a nuclear explosion, RDU personnel were ready to test their skills apparently with not live nuclear tests at both Nevada and later at Maralinga. Officials in the Department of National Defense created and maintained the unit as part of a wider scientific contribution to Western security, as is demonstrated by the cooperation of Canadian personnel in American and British nuclear weapons testing and fallout research. In fact, upon the recommendation of U.S. Admiral, an, an individual named Arthur Radford, number one RDU participated in Operation Teapot, a series of American nuclear tests conducted at the Nevada test site in 1955. Now, with the exception of Operation Crossroads, which occurred in 1946, Operation Teapot represented Canada's only direct participation in American nuclear tests during this first decade of the Cold War. The operation was the single largest series of nuclear tests involving human participants up until that time. Soldiers, sailors, and aviators of the Canadian Armed Services along with military officials and nuclear physicists, scientists, witnessed a series of nuclear explosions from trenches only 3,500 meters from the epicenter of each blast conducted during the operation. And following each explosion, number one RDU personnel used Geiger-Muller counters and other radiation detection equipment to measure radiological impact near ground zero and to measure and detect radiological toxicity. Now in the 1950s, the US Atomic Energy Commission invited journalists to witness some of the test explosions resulting in the image from the previous slide. Teapot was the third blast initiated by the Atomic Energy Commission. And following Operation Teapot, personnel of RDU received another initiative, this time from British officials to conduct follow-up research, excuse me, in Southern Australia. This was Operation Buffalo. Now a remote area in the Southern Australian desert, the Maralinda Range was the traditional territory of the indigenous Maralinda Torda people and included the sacred lands. Now the land was seized and handed over to the federal government for use by the British, subsequently resulting in the mass displacement of indigenous peoples. This is certainly an unfortunate history to say the least, which certainly deserves much more attention. Well, in the meantime though, Operation Buffalo to return to the Canadians commenced. On the 27th of September of 1956, a Royal Air Force bomber dropped the first of four nuclear weapons, which is with a 15 kiloton bomb named One Tree. Now the atomic cloud triggered by the blast reached over 10,000 feet higher than scientists had predicted. And the fallout carried hazardous particles eastward toward populated areas on Australia's east coast. And over the next three weeks, three more detonations followed with radioactive material being registered as far away as Queensland. Now the immediate area of Maralinga was completely contaminated. Canadian personnel, were most active during the final operational blast test. These individuals were fitted with protective gear and radiation detection instruments. And number one, RDU rode in jeeps near ground zero and conducted a detailed radiological survey during the day and night of the entire blast zone. Now the unit experienced partial contamination and blackouts and issues with all vehicles was really severe. Some personnel that de developed uh, decontamination issues on site. 
One report noted that the relatively quick decay of fallout enabled unit personnel to work increasingly close to the blast zone in normal clothes with gloves, rubber boots, and standard issue respirators. Personnel of number one RDU, however, also carried out a second exercise in the area where there was confirmed surface contamination and radioactive toxicity. They participated with Austra Australian battalions and reconnaissance troops in small simulated brigade advance, simulating an advance in a small scale nuclear war on the ground. Now this exercise enabled unit personnel to test experimental radiation detection and monitoring equipment under the theoretical conditions of a nuclear war, of course, under the live test conditions. Now, despite the medical advice of scientific authorities in the federal government at the time, Canadian military officials pre-approved abnormally high radiation doses for personnel of number one RDU at Operation Buffalo and the Marilinda Range. Provisional radiological safety standards at the range allowed for a dose of three Ronkin with the permission of the British Health Control Officer on site. In the event that service personnel needed to recover vital records, the trial superintendent had the authority to pre-approve higher levels. To the extent that senior Canadian military officials believed that specially trained soldiers to withstand radi higher radiation levels, the expectation of risk was considerably greater for personnel exposed to one RDU. The unit served as a radiological protectorate for the armed services, unknowingly risking personal health and safety in preparation for the nuclear battlefield. There was a belief that these individuals could be exposed to a certain level of radiation over the period of one month. And the belief, the scientific argument at the time by officials, by scientists and officials in the Department of National Defense, suggested that if unit personnel were exposed to their entire monthly allotment of radiation in a truncated period, that was perfectly acceptable and safe. This was a flawed understanding, but it underscored the military preparations and understanding at the time. Now, despite initial denials from the British government, Historical research has shown that service personnel were not only close to the explosions as they happen, but were also asked to walk, crawl, and run across contaminated ground, even without protective clothing. Today, there are considerably higher incidences of cancer in those individuals who were present at the trials as compared to the general population. Now, in 2012, an action against the Ministry of Defense brought about by the survivors of Marilinda failed, said in a lack of irrefutable scientific evidence linking illness to the explosions and to the testing that occurred at the range. Avon Hudson, who served with the Royal Australian Air Force at Marilinda and later blew the whistle about service participation in the experiments, is still fighting for justice is on record as ha of having said, quote, we were naive and trusting of our government. Now they were waiting for us to die. This is an uncomfortable history for, for many a politician because it cannot be spoken of in the abstract. Families are still suffering, close quote. Now indeed, this topic remains controversial. But to return to the Canadian participation and one RDU in particular, while well, members of the Canadian Armed Services experienced American and British atomic trials as both observers and participants, the personnel of one RDU experienced vastly different circumstances. Unlike the soldiers, sailors, and aviators who participated in nuclear weapons trials or decontamination work, members of one RDU received instructional duties designed to expose unit personnel to radiological contamination for training purposes. Canadian military officials believed that personnel of one RDU could safely receive monthly and yearly maximum permissible doses in a shortened period, as I explained earlier. Now, at no point were personnel of one RDU deliberately exposed to unsafe levels of radiation for experiments on the human body. 
but unit personnel did receive special treatment because they were believed to be superior radiological soldiers. Despite clear health and safety warnings from medical authorities in the Canadian government, military officials subjected personnel of one RDU to increased radiation exposure under flawed assumptions about tolerance level, and that is radiation tolerance levels in the human body. Training and expertise was thought to have distinguished the soldiers of one RDU, or so military officials wrongly believed and wrongly argued. One individual was exposed to radiation for a period of four weeks between September and October 1956. During this time, this individual experienced an accumulated dose of radiation of 3.65 Ronkin, which according to the records available to me that were released through access to information, was the highest recorded dosage of 50 Canadian personnel who were involved in Operation Buffalo. At the time, the International X-ray and Radium Protection Committee that I mentioned earlier in conjunction with Operation Teapot, well, this committee set the international safety standards for bodily exposure to radiation. As I noted earlier, the recommended exposure level at the time was 0.3 Ronkin per week for whole body exposure. So at 3.65 Ronkin over an entire month, this Canadian experienced radiation exposure levels at approximately 60% higher than the recommended international safety standards. Some of the records that you see on your slide here document the estimated dosage levels, that is radiation dosage levels, that were received by the Canadians on the ground. So yes, there are medical and scientific records documenting the Canadian experience and documented, documenting, excuse me, the estimated radiation levels that these individuals received while on the ground in Australia. Many of the records that are, are released through access to information or have redacted information. I've also on these slides blacked out the information of the individuals, both the scientists and of the military uh, personnel that were involved in the testing. I made this decision to black out the, uh, and redact the information from the slides here because I have yet to contact uh, the families of these individuals or attempt to contact their families, and I do not uh, have consent to release their names. But nonetheless, it is documented in a, a series of records that are available. And as I said, I've had many of these records, not all, but a, a large bulk of the records released to me through access to information. And some of these are on the slides here that I've shown you today. Now, in the spring of 1957, at the height of the Cold War, 40 Canadian soldiers were sent to Nevada on a top secret mission. Uh, some of these soldiers, as is argued in the documentary Time Bombs, uh, did serve as guinea pigs for military testing on a nuclear test site. Now, they played in a series of war games as close as 1,000 meters away from detonated test bombs that occurred. Several veterans fell victim then to radiation because of their experience in live nuclear trials in Nevada. And today, more than 60, more than 60 years after being exposed to dangerous nuclear radiation, some of the soldiers who have survived are fighting for justice as well as their families. And this documentary follows the story in particular of an individual named Jim Huntley, a veteran in relatively good health, who puts his case to the government and confronts the politicians, Canadian politicians in particular, who are trying to perhaps dampen the efforts of some of the veterans. Now, if you want to know uh, more information about my research here today, uh, I published a chapter in an edited collection called The Nuclear North, which is histories of Canada in the atomic age. And my chapter in that collection is titled Baptism by Fire, Canadian Soldiers and Radiation Exposure at Nevada and Marilinga. But briefly, uh, just by way of conclu conclusion, allow me to close my remarks by answering the question that I posed off the top. And that, to remind you again, was were Canadian personnel exposed to unsafe levels of radiation? Now, as I said, I am not a scientist, nor am I a medical doctor. As a historian, it is not for me to assess the health of the individuals 
who were involved in the experiments that in the testing that occurred. But I can partly answer this question through records that have been released through access to information, which do tell us that medical authorities at the time, both in the Canadian military and in the Department of National Defense, deem Canadian personnel to be exposed to abnormally high levels of radiation because of their experiences on the ground. Moreover, these records suggest that Army officials deliberately expose personnel of one RDU to hazardous conditions, despite knowing or despite knowledge of the existing health risk. And the refusal to heed medical advice for the safety of military personnel represents an understudied episode, I argue, of the history of military science in Canada and indeed Canadian military history more generally, which demonstrates, I think, the reach and influence of Cold War anxieties in Canada and facing Canadian officials during the new atomic age. So the health consequences of the Cold War then for Canadian military personnel, as with British and Australian and American individuals who also participated and experienced uh, live radiation during nuclear testing, certainly left a legacy that is worthy of recognition and further study. And allow me to uh, leave you with one small but important point for consideration, which is to say the history of nuclear testing is absolutely clear. In my mind, military priorities superseded concerns for human safety. There was no conspiracy to experiment on soldiers, sailors, or aviators. But scientists and military officials fearing a worst case scenario, which was a small scale nuclear war, made drastic decisions that ultimately put people, military personnel, in harm's way. And this is a legacy that is still with us, still with veterans, and still with families of the individuals affected today. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. I'll leave my comments there. Well, thank you so thank much, you so Matthew. Much. That was really interesting, and uh, um, I, I, le I learned so much. That was that was excellent, uh, and there it left me with a lot of questions to, um, that I, I want to ask. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a few at you. Um, I, I want to know first off is were the members of the number one RDU were they volunteers, and did they know they were being uh, exposed to? That, that, that's an excellent and certainly an important question, uh, Ken. Uh, so what I can tell you is that these were active members of, of the Canadian military and the Canadian Army in particular. Um, they did not necessarily volunteer per se to, par to participate in nuclear testing that occurred either at Nevada or uh, at the Marlinder Range in Australia. These were individuals that were deployed as part of one RDU, not as volunteers, but, of, but as active members of RDU and of the Canadian Army. So no, they did not necessarily volunteer for these tests, but there were other uh, individuals, not just military personnel themselves, but scientists and other officials in the Department of National Defense, who yes, did volunteer to, uh, to not only observe nuclear tests, but also participate in those trials. The important distinction that I want to make there is that there is, um, uh, there is a big difference between individuals who observe nuclear testing on the ground and individuals such as one RDU, who actually not only observe nuclear tests, but actually drove into and were closer to blast sites following a detonation and who experienced direct exposures to radiation after uh, uh, one explosion or a series of explosions. Did these guys know that they are being exposed to dangerous chemicals and radiation? No, uh, I mean, the, the short answer is no. Um, what I'll say on that is the science uh, at the time uh, in terms of the, the known dangers of radiation was certainly not as advanced as it is today. And I can emphasize that point uh, in a few different ways. One is that soldiers that were on the ground uh, were informed by military officials and by the scientists who were directing these trials at the time uh, that because most of these explosions did not take place at the ground level, these were atmospheric or lower atmospheric explosions uh, that took place higher off the ground. The idea, the prevailing attitude was that the wind would literally carry any dangerous radiation or radiotoxicity away from the blast sites. 
And as long as it wasn't visible, then that direct danger that was thought to be exposing to soldiers wasn't considered as severe. I did also emphasize that in one other point. I explained this in my chapter. I didn't go into the details here today, but a number of soldiers that experienced nuclear trials at the Nevada test site actually had with them wooden plaques, wooden plaques which they had their uh, a stencil of their name, and they placed these wooden plaques with a stencil of their name in front of their trenches when they observed a blast. Now the heat from these blasts were so severe that it would actually burn their name into the wood of these plaques based off the stencil, right? And many of these soldiers, not understanding then the dangers of radiation that they carried with them, took these plaques home as souvenirs of their participation in the nuclear trials. So the short answer uh, to, to, to that question is no. The soldiers uh, were not necessarily aware of the dangers, uh, they were told that it was safe. They were told that it was safe to be on the ground, and that they uh, and they certainly believed in both the science, uh, the scientists, and the military authorities who were giving them this advice and saying that it was safe for them to uh, part partake in these, uh, not only these tests but also these um, training exercises. Thanks. Another question, sort of along that line, is: Did these guys have any training on radiation? Did they have any special training? before going into this. Right, so I, 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 I and this is another uh, part of my chapter that I get into a little bit more in depth, but soldiers uh, and unit personnel of number one radiation detection unit in particular did have some training with live radiation at Chalk River. Now they were sent to Chalk River in the early 1950s uh, to take part in a cleanup effort. There was a radioactive leak on site um, in, in one of the one of the reactors on site. And this was the extent of the participation or training that soldiers had prior to being sent to uh, observe and partake in live nuclear trials at, at uh, Nevada and at Mar-a-Lago. So the, the answer to that then is no, they did not have direct participation with live radiation other than, uh, re uh, other than the reactor cleanup at Chalk River. And once the, they experienced a uh, live nuclear test at uh, Nevada and Maralinga, this was their first experience with live radiation on the ground and at site. Okay, thanks. Um, you mentioned one thing you mentioned, you said that they were, uh, people were superior radiological soldiers. What made a person a superior radiological soldier? Right, yes, no, no, that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, this was the belief, right, that, an individual who was trained to handle a radioactive contaminated site might be able to withstand greater amounts of radiation because their bodies were trained to not only absorb radiation, but handle a certain level. Now, the scientific and medical consensus at the time that the Canadian military applied was the notion, as I mentioned in my talk here today, that if there was a, a maximum limit of radiation that the individual body could be exposed to, as long as military officials and as long as soldiers were aware of those levels and that they did not go over those levels, either during training or during live nuclear testing, that was completely acceptable. Now, in reference uh, to what may, would, would have made a superior radiological soldier, that would have been, in theory, number one radiation detection unit personnel personnel that were trained to handle a nuclear attack and were trained to handle a, a decontamination or a radiological site survey on site after a small scale nuclear attack. So theoretically then, if there was an attack on a major Canadian city or populated area, the first military personnel sent in before civil defense or before anyone else in the military would have been number one radiation detection unit because in theory, as superior radiological soldiers, these individuals would have understood how to assess radioactive toxicity on site and assess the dangers for the Canadian military, for the Canadian government, and of course, later on, for the Canadian civilian population as a whole. Uh, th thanks. <laughs> um, and then the next question leads into that is, is, were there any practical applications that came from the number one RDU's work? 
Uh, there were certainly practical applications, uh, especially at, at Chalk River. Uh, I mentioned that uh, number one RDU was involved in, in decontamination and cleanup of, of reactor accidents at Chalk River. Uh, so there was certainly real uh, time and applicable uh, use of military and, uh, and personnel in that regard in terms of decontamination work. There was also a great deal of application in terms of training for civil defense. I did not really explore this in my talk in great detail, but I uh, explore this in, in my wider chapter, where personnel of number one RDU also functioned to in a capacity of training individuals for civil defense. So training individuals in the Canadian government and uh, in generals, uh, people in the general population who may have volunteered in order to understand then and how to prepare for a nuclear war. If we take a step back though, and we examine, of course, fortunately, there was no uh, nuclear attack on Canada. There was no, uh, there was no small scale nuclear war. So number one, RDU and the Canadian military as a whole was certainly not put into a circumstance or a situation where they were meant to test number one, RDU. But in terms of the practical applicability, yes, these individuals were used um, and, and, and uh, were in, uh, employed, excuse me, at Chalk River. But there are also general uh, applications in terms of the wider history of Canada's involvement in American and British nuclear testing, where Canadian authorities did work in conjunction with their British and American authorities, and one RDU played is certainly a, an important role in that. Thank you. Um, it just seems so odd that you know people are training for nuclear war. <laughs> it just it's a concept that it's hard to get your mind around sometimes. Um, well, one of the the last questions. Um, are the the records that you shared? Are these are available for the general public? And where did you where where were you able to source these? Right. So so yes, by and large, uh, these records have been made available through access to information. Um, if if anyone's interested in following up, I'm certainly happy to share my resources. Uh, so the records I shared with you today during my presentation, I obtained through making a formal request through Library and Archives Canada under the Access to Information Act. So Library and Archives Canada, of course, is Canada's national archive and national repository of records. The records that I showed you here on my slides today were transferred from the Department of National Defense to Library and Archives Canada, and they were closed upon transfer. I made a request for access to information, and a large bulk of those records were made available to me. Now, does that mean to say that those records are openly available online? No, they are not. But uh, individuals uh, and public researchers are certainly uh, more than uh, more than able to reach out to Library and Archives Canada, and just as I did, make a formal request uh, to obtain those records. And because a large bulk of those records have been opened through access to information, uh, you can obtain those records through Library and Archives Canada and through the Department of National Defense. Well, thank you. Um, and you, your talk was did what it was supposed to. It made me want to learn more. Uh, so it was really good. Thank you so much, Matthew. It's um, really a fascinating topic, and I, I'm uh, yeah, I want to find out more about this. So it's it's really led me into want, want to discover more about this part of um, Canadian Ken, history. We actually have one more question that just Thank came you. in. Uh, oh. Were you able to find statistics on cancer rates in the unit? And if so, how much higher compared to normal? I assume some statistics must have been used in the lawsuits. That, that, thank you very much for that question. Uh, that's a great question. As I mentioned during my talk, um, in my research, I really don't get into um, uh, the later medical implications of radiation exposure per se. Uh, the records that I show with you uh, in my presentation and on my slides, these are records of estimated radiation dosages received by unit personnel on the ground at the time. So those were records directly from the 1950s, right? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there were there there are no records that link unit personnel and radiation dosages that were received to cancer or to other illness that may, may have uh, came after the fact. Right? Those uh, records might exist, but to my knowledge, they do not. Um, now, it's important also to mention to say that a large bulk of records about the unit history were destroyed uh, in, the, in the 19, 
It's, it's either the late 1950s or into the 1960s. Uh, they were destroyed for a number of reasons, um, which is to say that uh, the full documented military and medical history of the unit no longer exists. There is a large bo a bulk of records available, some of which I have access, as I mentioned, through access to information. But no, um, at, at, at this time, uh, there are no records that link radiation exposure to cancer or to other illnesses. And uh, that's certainly something uh, uh, to follow up on. And but I think it's also it, that's been a study in um, in Australia. This has been an issue that's been studied in the United States and indeed in the United Kingdom. And it is extremely difficult uh, and unfortunate, of course, to link uh, radiation exposure during nuclear testing to cancer and to other illnesses, which is by no means to deny that that happened and that occurred. It's certainly unfortunate we know that a lot of soldiers um, have died from cancer and from other illnesses, and that is perhaps a result of their participation, but I do not have any direct proof or, or any records linking radiation exposures to cancer or to other illnesses. To follow up on that, were, were there any immediate effects to the, the soldiers? Like, did they have their hair fall out or any lesions on their faces or, you know, any anything on their, their bodies that, you know, would show that the cancer or the, there was cancer or radiation exposure? Did they have any, like, immediate effects from this? Yes. So there, the, during um, testing at Chalk River in particular, there were re reported instances of soldiers who actually had uh, not only exposure to radiation, but they were exposed to uh, radioactively contaminated water um, at, at one of the reactor sites. And these individuals did have severe burns and had to go through a decontamination process as, that was quite scientific and quite medically uh, medical. And this was documented at the time. Uh, and, and those records are available and those do exist. So those are radiation burns and those uh, um, that did uh, apply to soldiers at the time. In terms of soldiers that were exposed to radiation during the actual nuclear trials themselves, uh, I do not know um, of any records about, uh, say, radiation burns or other, other injuries. But yes, there is documented instances, excuse me, of soldiers and of military personnel who did receive injuries um, as a result of experience in these trials. Now, in specific relation to the, the unit personnel of one RDU, I did not see that information in the records, but I know just conducting history in this area, other soldiers, um, be it in the British uh, or the American experience, yes, that is documented in the history of, of various radiation burns and other injuries uh, as a direct result of their participation in nuclear weapons trials. Okay, th thank you. You know your stuff, Matthew. <laughs> That's great. Um, so again, I want to thank you again for, for a really great talk tonight. Uh, really interesting. And um, I hope everyone runs out and, and uh, gets your book uh, and uh, gets a chance to read that. Um, I want to let everyone know that uh, next month on March 17th, uh, we have Dr. David Boris, who will talk on civilian affairs in Northwestern Europe from 1944 to 1945. I think that'll be a really uh, interesting talk as well. Um, and Wolf Museums is open uh, to the public and no appointment is necessary. Uh, we have two new exhibits on display. Uh, you want, might want to check out our, our website to find out more about them. And uh, on the 25th of uh, February, we have our next fourth Friday. Uh, and we have uh, our performer is Verse Basil Bowen, and she will be performing live at the Civic Museum. And you can get tickets for that uh, on our website through Eventbrite, and they, it is free. So you might want to get your tickets early. We, uh, it is licensed, and uh, we are able to serve drinks and food um, for that event. And it'll be really great to have a live performer back at the museum. So looking forward to that. Uh, and if you want to check, find out more about it, uh, go to the museum's web website. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, and for the great questions and uh, hope to see you back again uh, next month. Have a great, great week and stay out of the weather and stay home and stay safe. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. I, I hope you are all well and safe and thank you for joining us tonight.